Lord Jesus, you fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Give to us self-discipline. In Jesus' name. Amen. The view that Revelation is personal is indebted to Soren Kierkegaard's distinction between objective and subjective truth. In the later existentialist discussions. I would say that's quite wrong there, Millard. Seeking objective truth, which comes in the form of proposition, when attempts to define an item by putting it into various classes. In doing so, however, one inevitably is limiting the item. The focus of subjective truth, on the one hand, is personal relationship rather than objective information. In emphasizing subjective knowledge, Bart and others of his school of thought have been wary, wary of falling into the trap of subjectivism. The position that truth is nothing but one's subjective reaction or response. To avoid this trap, they assert that faith must also requires faith as assent. Bart, for example, insists that faith is fiducia, but that it includes noticia, knowledge, and a census as well. Edward Carnell has expressed this by saying that all vital faith rests upon gen general faith. General faith is believing a vital, is vital. Vital faith is trusting in a person. He maintains that wherever there is trust, there is at least an implicit belief. He points out that he does not simply embrace the first woman he meets. Rather, before embracing the woman, he ascertains that she is his wife. The process of determining that she is his wife may not be a very lengthy, detailed, or formal one. It nevertheless occurs. That there must be belief before there can be trust is evident from our own experiences. Suppose I have to make a bank deposit in cash, but I'm unable to do so in person. I must ask someone else to do it for me. But who will I ask? To whom will I entrust myself, or at least a portion of my mere material possessions? I trust or commit myself to someone whom I believe to be honest. Believing in that person depends upon believing in something about him. I'll probably select a good friend whose integrity I do not question. I will certainly make at least some sort of preliminary assessment of his honesty, crude or incomplete, though such a judgment must necessarily be. Similarly, the advocates of the view that revelation is personal as well as those who advocate the view that it is propositional or informational, recognize that their faith must rest on some basis. The question is whether the non-propositional view of revelation provides sufficient basis for faith. Can the advocates of this view be sure that they encounter is really the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? in the 19th century, Ludwig Frauerbach pointed out in his Essence of Christianity that the object of faith may be nothing more than one self-projection. One perhaps might trust may simply be a father image, one superego, or something of that type. For Carnell and others who hold to the propositional or informational view, of revelation. Faith consists in believing certain affirmations about God. He's all powerful, loving, everywhere present, triune, and placing one's trust in God so defined. In theory, it is possible to offer evidence which would serve to confirm or verify these affirmations. In neo orthodoxy's view, however, God does not tell us something about himself. We simply know him in the encounter. But how do we know that, that, that it is a Christian God we encounter unless he tells us who he is and what he's like? 
Are there any criteria by which we can recognize that our encounter is the encounter with a Christian God? <clears throat> Bear in mind our earlier discussion of the personal nature of religious language, chapter 6. Because of this personal nature, we can come to know God as we know other humans. The parallel eventually breaks down. We can recognize a person by a glance at his face without telling who he is. If this is not true of God, how do we recognize him as being triune instead of single in person? While neo-orthodoxy maintains that God is genuinely known in the encounter, that faith evokes implicit belief in the truth of certain claims or propositions, it does not make clear how this happens. The common answer is that revelation is self-certifying, not self-evident. In addition, the orthodox suggests that just as the best response to the question, how will I know it when I'm loved, is you will simply know the answer to the question. How do I know that it is God that I encounter? It is simply, I know. Emma Brunner has faced this problem in our faith. He raises the question of books other than the Bible, which claim to be God's word. What about the God met through them? Is it the Christian God? Brunner's first response is these books simply do not apply to non-Muslims and non-Hindus. His second response is that the voice Stranger is heard in these books that is a voice other than that which we hear in the Bible. Is this really an adequate answer? He says that the voice heard in these other books may somehow be God's voice too, but it is scarcely recognizable. Hundreds of millions of Muslims and Hindus find reality in the encounter with a God through their own books some as emphatically as any Christian. Are they wrong or are we all encountering the same thing? Again, his answer seems merely to be we are not Muslims or Hindus. Apparently God and truth can be encountered in various ways. But does this not teeter on the brink of subjectivism? This poses another problem, the problem of theology. Those who maintain that revelation personal are nevertheless very concerned about correctly defining belief or stating correct doctrinal understanding while of course insisting that faith is not belief in doctrinal propositions yeah there's the contradiction they don't believe in propositions you got a five volume systematic theology about what their encounters for example, over, argued over such issues as the nature and status of the image of God and man, as well as the virgin whooped birth and empty tomb. Presumably each felt he was trying to establish the two true doctrine in these areas. But how are these doctrinal propositions related to or derived from non-propositional revelation? There's a problem here. Brunner has insisted that there are no revealed truths dogmatically stated, but there are truths of revelation. The doctrine, he insists, is a token, is indissolubly connected with the framework it represents, that is, our personal encounter with God. He also says that God does not deliver to us a series of lectures in dogmatic theology or submit a confession of faith to us, but instructs us authentically about himself. He tells us authentically all who he is and what he wills for us. This almost sounds like the revealed truths which Brunner has taken great pains to avoid. Also, what is the nature of the indissoluble connection between doctrine and encounter if there's no revealed truth? His response is to introduce an analogy between doctrine and the sacraments of the Lord's Supper. 
as the Lord is himself present in, with, and under the elements, which are the token of the sacrament. So the Lord is present in, with, and under doctrine, which is the token of the encounter. There are several problems with this analogy. One is that it tries to explain the obscure by the more obscure. A conception of the Lord's Supper based upon a now obsolete or incomprehensible metaphysic. But for from this there is still a difficulty. It is one thing to say that the presence of the Lord cannot be maintained without doctrine. But how is this doctrine derived at? How is it derived from the encounter? How does one establish that the form of doctrine presented by Bruner is more correct than Bart? Bernard Ram has pointed out that Bart has some, <laughs> somewhere derived six million words of propositions in the church dogmatics from non-propositional encounter. Ram remarks that the relationship of the gospel statements of the encounter is in a poor state of integration within neo-orthodoxy. John Newton Thomas speaks of the anomalous state of scripture. In Bart's thinking, revelation is maintained to be non-propositional. And yet the words of scripture somehow express its cognitive content. Thomas complains that Bart proceeds to settle doctrinal issues by quoting the Bible in the same fashion as does the fundamentalist whose views he rejects. This is not to suggest that there cannot be a connection between non-propositional revelation and propositions of truth. But that quick connection has been not ex adequately ex explicated by neo-orthodoxy. The problem arises from the disjunction between propositional and personal revelation. Revelation is either personal or propositional. It, it's not either or, it's both and. Thank you. What God primarily do, does is to reveal himself. But he does so in part by telling us something about himself. But we do not face the problem of impersonality when we consider propositions about God. Does not it give us I-it relationships rather than I-thou? The analysis implied by these two expressions in both is both incomplete and misleading. Scripture as Revelation If Revelation includes propositional truths, then it is of such a nature that it can be preserved. It can be written down or inscripturated this written record to the extent that it is an accurate reproduction, reproduction of the original revelation. It's also by derivation, revelation, and entitled to be called that. The definition of revelation becomes a factor here. If revelation is defined as the, only the actual occurrence, the process, or the revealing, then the Bible is not revelation. Revelation is something that occurred long ago. If, however, it is the product, the result, well, the Bible may also be termed revelation. We're not dealing here with the Pope Princetonian. In, in similar fashion, the word speech may mean the actual occurrence, the mouthing of words, the gestures. It may also mean that which is spoken. Kenneth Pike, the linguist, has noted that, that denial, of denial of propositional revelation is based upon too narrow a view of language. Certainly, language has social relevance and purpose and is designed to communicate with and affect other people, but it serves other purposes, talking with oneself, formulating ideas for oneself, storing these ideas. <clears throat> the neo-orthodox insistence that there is no revelation without response 
ignores the fact that while a message may be available for others, they might not as yet be prepared to receive it. Like uses the illustration of the great scientific scholar who gives a lecture to a group of graduate students, none of whom understood what is said. A tape recording is made in the lecture, however. After three years of study, the students listen to it again and now understand. Nothing, however, has happened to the content of the tape. It was truth on both the earlier and later occasions. The larger issue is the nature of revelation. If revelation is propositional, it can be preserved. And if this is the case, then the question of whether the Bible is in this derivative sense of revelation is a question of whether it is inspired or it indeed preserves what was revealed. This will be the subject of the next chapter. You should note that this revelation is progressive. Some care needs to be exercised in the use of this term, for it has sometimes been used to present the idea of a gradual evolutionary development. This is not what we have in mind. The approach which flourished under liberal scholarship regarded sections of the Old Testament as virtually obsolete and false. They were only very imperfect approximations of the truth. The idea which we are here suggesting, however, is that later revelation builds upon earlier revelation. It is complementary to it, not contradictory. Note the way in Jesus, in which Jesus elevated the teachings of the law by extending, expanding, and internalizing them. He frequently prefaced his instruction with the expression, you have heard, but I say to you, in a similar fashion, the author of Hebrews points out that God, who in the past spoke by the prophets, has in these days spoken by a son who reflects the glory of God, bears the very stamp of the nature. We've seen that God has taken the initiative to make himself known in a more complete way than general revelation, and has done in so in a fashion appropriate to our understanding. This means that lost and sinful humans can come to know God and go on an understanding of what he expects and promises of his children. Because this revelation includes both personal presence of God and informational truth, we are able to identify God, understand something about him, and point others to him. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.